Good morning, good morning. Hope everybody's doing well. We're doing well? Okay, all right, we're doing well. All right. Open your Bibles to the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2. We're just going to jump right into it. Uh, we're going to read the entire chapter. I said last week we're going to be reading the entire chapters as we go along. So 1 Thessalonians, you pull it up on your phone if you want to. This is the NIV on both translations on the board and then in my Bible. Uh, not much difference if you have the NLT, but just let's go with it. It's starting at verse 1. It says, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know, we never use flattery, nor did we put a mask on to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, nor from anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like you, like young children amongst you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we love you so much, we are delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but, not, but also our lives as well. Verse 9, surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardships. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were amongst you who believe. For you know, this is verse 11, that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. This is verse 13. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it is actually is the word of God, which indeed at work is at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's church in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease, excuse me, they displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they might be saved. In this way, they always heap upon their, heap their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Verse 17, but brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned, being separated from you for a short time, this is in person, not in thought. Out of, the, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are, your, you are our glory and our joy. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, it is my prayer I speak not as a man, but as an oracle of you proclaiming truth. Jesus, I pray right now that our eyes would be open, that we could see the spirit moving in this place, that our ears would be open, that we might hear the gentle whisper of the Father, who in fact transforms our lives. In Jesus' name we all say, amen. Okay, so let me give you a couple thoughts here real quick. So as we talked about last week, Paul is writing this to the church in Thessaloniki, right? So he's letting everybody know like, hey, this church is amazing. It's a great, it's a great church. There are awesome things happening. I told you about the persecution, right? It got so hot that Paul had to get out of town and then the persecution actually got upped. And so this church really stood strong. Matter of fact, uh, if you do a little research here, Paul is actually in this first letter, he is kind of comparing and contrasting two different churches. On one church, you have the church of Thessalonica right here, the Thessalonians. And on the other church, you have the Corinthian church. Now, what's interesting is Paul only writes two letters to the Thessalonians, but we're not quite sure how many letters. Some are between four and some are between six, but we only have two to the Corinthians. And what he's saying is, hey, everybody who's over here in Thessalonians, they're an amazing church. They're doing amazing things. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say, they give me great joy. They give me great happiness as compared to the Corinthian church, which has got a whole lot of problems. Like one problem, we got the stepmom sleeping with the stepson. Jerry, 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 right? Like, we, <laughs> I had to. It's the only thing I think of when I read that stuff. Like, like, it was Jerry Springer before Jerry Springer was Jerry Springer. This is great. Only in God's word. So you got all these problems in the Corinthians church. 
And matter of fact, Paul keeps calling him out. He writes very long letters. Like I said, there's even additional letters we have never found that were circulating that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church to say, hey, listen, I've got to do all this correction. So the question that we have to ask is what were the identifiable markers that on one hand with the Thessalonian church, he goes, man, now these are real Christians. These are true believers. This is who I hang my hat on. Like if I'm gonna brag about any church, I'm bragging about this Thessalonian church. And then what was the contrast with the Corinthians church where he's going, man, I got a problem for days. Man, I'm really, they're exhausting me. Like, oh my gosh, right? So one, you have like a standard and the other one lacks all standard, right? Well, if you ask me upon reading this and I just wanna build a case, okay? So just stick with me a little bit. I wanna build a case that one of the primary factors or indicators that, that made this church in Thessalonians so strong, and here it is, is that they were being spiritually fathered by Paul. We're asking prayer to the Corinthian church. They have this, um, they had this way about them, this strong independence where they were like, we don't need anybody to tell us anything. We'll just serve God the way we want to serve God where the Thessalonian church was going, hey, Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to invest in us. Continue to be a spiritual father to us. Now, I just want to build my case there. So hold that thought. We'll pause and I'm going to build my case from there. I want to show you what I call family business. And I just want to take this brief paragraph and I want to build my case right here. Look at, look at the word choice that Paul uses. Look at what it says. You already know, this is the end of verse six, beginning of seven. You already know brothers and sisters. He's immediately identifying everybody who's in the church as a brother or a sister. Matter of fact, if you were, if you've grown up, if you've grown up old school church, everybody was brother and sister. I remember when I first got saved, that was brother so-and-so and and sister so-and-so. At one point I was like, dang, everybody related? (laughs) My gosh, how many, how many kids your parents have? And it was actually a sign of respect, right? Brother so-and-so. And And then if they had more prestige, it was elder so-and-so. You guys tracking with me? So he starts off with brothers and sisters. He goes, our visit was not without results. And so he's, he's saying right from the jump, like, I can see the spiritual growth in you. I can see that when I left the first time you were one way, and now I'm hearing rumors that you're another way, and they're all good reports. I see this growth in you. Instead, we were like young children. Look at this imagery amongst you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, we cared for you. Now think about that imagery. For all you moms out there who have had babies and all you dads, you know, think about this. The mom is literally nursing. Babies only do four things. I mean, let's be honest. They're, they're going to sleep. They're going to eat. They're going to poo. And they're going to cry. It's just that simple. And, and the way they trick you is they, they smile at you every now and then. like, <laughs> And you go, oh, my gosh, you're so adorable. I'll do this all over again. <laughs> right? They trick you. Little boogers, they trick you. Right? And that's really, that's all they do. But they are 100% dependent on you, mom. Remember, there was no bottles back in the day. It was 100% dependent on mom. And he goes, this is it. How we took care of you. Spiritually, we took care of you. You were 100% dependent on us and this new faith we were bringing, and we were not going to abandon you. We were going to hold you tight. Think of this imagery he uses, okay? He goes on to say, He goes on, so we cared for you, for you know that we dealt with each of you. Now, look at this now. As a father would deal with his own children. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's church in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. He's saying, listen, not only did you lean in and you let us take care of you spiritually like a mother, but you also allowed us to correct you like a father. That is very, very interesting. And just this one paragraph, how Paul is really trying to say, hey, listen, this is, this is what sets you apart from everybody else. You have this whole theme of a family working in your church. Now listen, Paul, remember, Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And in Paul's books that he, written to the, that he wrote to the churches, he's always referring back to either us as a family or us as the body of Christ. He's always referring And there's a reason why he's referring because you and I as believers, we have to change our paradigm, which is a way of thinking. We have to change our perception that if we're going to be a part of this right here called the ecclesia, that's what the church is called, the ecclesia, which means the called out ones, the ones who are different. If we're going to be a part of this church, we need to view things differently. Now, here's where I'm going with this. So a lot of you have family that's blood, but they might not necessarily be believers. 
Did you catch that? So I have cousins, I have theas and theos, right? They're family by blood, but they're not in the family of believers. In other words, they don't believe in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. So think about this. My time on earth or their time on earth, that'll all be limited. That'll come to a conclusion. That'll come to an end. So in all actuality, you will spend more time on the other side of heaven with those who have faith in common with you, brothers and sisters, than you will with family members who are just bound by blood. Because there's going to be a separation. If they don't, if they don't receive Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, they will not enter eternal's gates. They, they will not enter eternity with Christ. Does that make sense? So Paul is trying to say, listen now, you're going to spend more time on the other side of heaven with those who have faith in common than with those who you are blood relations with. And so he's trying to get you to understand this concept. Now, why is he trying to get you to understand this concept? Let's go to another book he wrote, and let's take a look at this verse in the amplified version, okay? This simply means a version that is just a little bit more words to the Greek context. Okay, look at Galatians 6.10. So then, while we as individual believers, you and I, individual believers, okay, have the opportunity, let us do good to all people. Stop right there. Let us do good to all people. When God says all people, guess what he means? All people. That means whether they believe in him or don't believe in him, we're to be good to all the people. That means the person at Starbucks who's taking your order. That means the person at Walmart who's making sure you, you, know, you check out at the register accordingly. That means to the person who you're trying to return something at Costco. How many like returning stuff at Costco? Isn't that always fun? Right? I mean, so no matter who it is, the person who cuts you off, you got to be good to them. The person who flipped you off, you got to be good to them. Okay, y'all see where I'm going with this. Let us do good to all people. He's going to explain to you what does it mean to do good? What does that mean? Look at what he says. He says to do good, not only being helpful, but also doing that which promotes spiritual growth. So it's not just saying being helpful, hold the door open for somebody. It's how can you help people grow spiritually? Now listen to what he says. He says, and especially... In other words, let me add something on. I want you to be a blessing. I want you to add value to people, especially to those who are in the household of faith. Look to your left. Look to your right. That's all of y'all. And here's what I see. Listen to me. Here's what I see. I see a lot of people who are willing to forgive their coworkers, but not willing to forgive somebody they go to church with. I see a lot of people who are willing to give family members who you know going to do you wrong again. But the, the one time somebody in the church does you wrong, oh, everybody hypocrites. I see a lot of people who are willing to go out of their way for people they don't know, but won't budge one inch for the people they do know inside the body of Christ. And what's crazy is, I don't know about you, but, but I remember growing up as a kid and some, something my parents always told me, right? My mom and dad both always said, you got to get thick skin. Don't be so easily upset. You got to get thick skin. The world's going to, you know, chew you up and spit you out. You got to be thick skin. And, and, and that's true. And so I don't know if we think of people in the world, we think we got to be tough. Like, I mean, we got to just let that roll, right? We just, you can't involve ourselves with that. All of a sudden you get saved and you get soft. Start walking into church. Well, so-and-so didn't say hi to me. Well, did you say hi to them? Nope. Well, that's probably why you didn't get a hi back. <laughs> Come in here and we start getting critical about everything. Well, I don't know about those snacks. Bring your own. Don't stop here at the movie theater, does it? Y'all be walking in with a purse, calling it a suitcase, dragging it behind you. What you got today? It's just some things. Pulling out a whole, like, three-piece taco set. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I got stories. I've sat, I've sat next to some ghetto people before in the movie theater. I'm like, how'd you get that in here? My gosh. They're like a whole pizza party tray. That's impressive. Right? You got people coming in, well, I don't know about the worship. Well, we ain't singing for you. You know, well, that's not my song. We don't even know what song you like. <laughs> right? Came in rolling up to, to Ice Cube, today's a good day. Now you want to talk about what worship song we singing. <laughs> we ain't singing that one. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? But we do. We get saved and all of a sudden we get soft. He goes, hold on, wait a minute. If you're going to be good to everybody else out there, you need to be especially good to everybody in here. That means when we say love God, love people, make connections, y'all need to make a connection. 
Y'all need to like really go out of your way and meet somebody. He says, this is what we're doing. Because listen, we're a family. That one person you don't like in this church, God going to make him your neighbor for eternity. Like, dang, like that, Pastor? You'd be waking up to that smile every day. Hey. How you doing, neighbor? It's not really like that, but it's funny. That, this is all I'm saying. Okay, let me show you something else. First Timothy, this is again what Paul wrote. Paul wrote this in First Timothy. Now, Timothy is called a pastoral epistle. Basically, it's a handbook for pastors on how to run the church, okay? It's a handbook for pastors on how to run the church. Look what he says in First Timothy 5. He says, never speak harshly to an older man. In some of your translations, if you have the um, New King James, it says, never re rebuke or correct an older man. That's what it will say uh, in that translation. But appeal to him respectfully as you would to your own father. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up old school. If you pop off and get smart mouth to your dad, he just smack you in public. There was no CPS. There was no, I'm going to go call somebody. They were like, you can call anybody you want. It don't matter because I smacked them too. How many of your parents used to say that? I was like, dang, we smacking everybody today. And if you had that one sibling that stuck up for you, they're going to get smacked too. So all the siblings just sit there quiet like, you stupid. <laughs> Says never, just, you know, old school. He said, look at this. Talk to a younger man as it would be your own brother. Treat older women as you would your mother. And treat younger women with all purity as you would your own sisters. Look at this, look at this imagery again. Mom, dad, brothers, sisters. So in other words, listen, there is a way to act in the church. And really what it comes down to is know your role and know how to treat others. He's saying if we're going to be different in the church, we're going to have to act different. And so once again, I just submit to you the big theme here, the big theme is something in this Thessalonian church they caught. And in my opinion, they caught how, they caught how to be fathered. And so now watch this. I'm going to tell you a true story. I can't make this up. This is very true. So at the gym I work out at, uh, there's this older guy who I've known for the last couple of years. And he, when I say older, he's quite possibly older than my dad. He's at least my dad's age, if not older. And so when I bring different people to the gym uh, to work out with me, uh, it's funny as I'll introduce him. He's a super cool guy, like super friendly, super nice. He's always picking on the people I bring, you know, just kind of like old man joking way, like, hey, you better keep up with him and, you know, all this stuff. And, and uh, long story short, he's never called me my real name. I don't know where it got mixed up, but one day, uh, I don't know who told him what, but he thinks my name is Andrew. <laughs> and so when I'll introduce him, because I know his name, and when I introduce him to like one of the boys, they'll say, well, how do you like working out with Andrew? And they'll look and I'm like, hi, I'm Andrew. Because <laughs> they don't know who he's talking about. And for the last year and a half, I've never corrected this guy. I, I, I've never corrected him. So I've introduced him to at least 12, 13 people and I've never corrected him. He literally, he'll come up to me tomorrow. I guarantee I'll see him tomorrow. He'll go, how you doing, Andrew? I'm doing good. Have a good workout. I will. Like, it, it just, and you may say, well, well, why? Let's go back and look at the first, first Timothy 5. Never speak harshly. Don't do it. Listen, listen, listen. You guys are judging his words, but I can see his heart. This guy cares a lot about me. It doesn't matter that he got my name wrong. I, I, I don't care. And that really doesn't bother me. Why? Because I follow what the Word of God says. There's no need for me for, there's absolute, listen, I, I'm going to use a phrase, but I don't mean it literally, okay? I bet you $1,000. I don't mean that literally because I ain't got $1,000. But I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just betting you. When he finds out, because he will, that my name is not Andrew, he'll be the first person to come up to me and apologize and feel horrible. I guarantee it. I just, I know the man. I just know him. And I'm going to tell him, don't worry about it. You can call me Andrew the rest of your life. It really don't bother me. Why? Because I'm taking this verse and I understand it's not about Anthony. It's not about me. God knows my name. That's the only person I need to know my name is God. That's all that matters in the end. If God don't say your name, you're in trouble. I don't care what everybody else calls you. But if God don't speak your name, well, you in trouble. We ain't all in trouble. You in trouble. I'm making sure God knows my name and speaks my name. And so I take this literally. Same thing with, listen, listen, listen. Let me, let me, 
Let me share something with you. When I go to the store and I see an, 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 an older woman, like my mom's age, I don't even think twice. I let her go in front of me. This is what Paul's saying. If I see a sister being harassed by somebody, I step up. I don't, I don't film it. I say something. Because that's what the Bible says. If I see a young brother getting ready to make a stupid mistake, I speak to him. You can ask people who know me, and I'll say, hey, I, I know I'm not old enough to be your dad, so I'm going to be more like that cool uncle. <laughs> what you want me to say? I want to be more like that jerk uncle? No, I don't, you know, nobody wants the jerk uncle, right? I want to be the cool uncle. You know, the one that's kind of like barely older than you, you know what I'm saying? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> How many of you got an uncle barely older than you? That's Mexicans for you. Come on, somebody. You know how that works. <laughs> Point is this. I'm following what it says here. Can I show you something? I'm going to show you something that, 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 remember, I'm building this case now that Paul's saying there's something different about the church of Thessalonians than the church of Corinthians, right? Let me show you something. Open your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. If you want to go to 1 Corinthians, just turn your pages to the right, just a couple books, okay? Just, I'm, I'm talking probably about 40, 30 pages, depending on how large your text is of your, of your Bible. Go to your phones. I want you to screenshot this. I mean, stick a pin in 1 Corinthians. I want you to reread this today. I want to show you something. This is 1 Corinthians 4. Once again, I want you to hear the words Paul chooses on purpose. This is very interesting. Paul says in verse 14, I'm writing this to the Corinthians church not to shame you. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm not trying to put shame on you. Sometimes you go to church and they just try to shame you into good, into good works and good behavior. You know, pastors feel pressure. We feel pressure. We get judged by whether or not our church grows and our church gets big. That's how people judge us. Instead of judging the content of people that are walking out of the church. I'm not interested in growing a big church. I'm interested in growing big people. It matters to me. Why? Because the storm is coming. The rain is coming. The hail is coming. The winds are coming. And if you're not built on a foundation of Christ and God's word, you're going to get blown to pieces. But if you're built on the rock, you'll withstand everything. And so I don't feel that pressure because I don't want to be a mile wide and an inch deep. I don't want to look good but have no substance. I'd rather y'all have substance. Does that make sense? So he's saying to the Corinthians church, listen, I'm not trying to speak shame on you. Look at what he says. He says, but I warn you as my dear children, I'm trying to bring some correction. I'm trying to give you a good looking out here, a heads up to what's to come. This is what he says. Even if you had 10,000, your translation might say voices. 10,000 voices. Mine says guardians. Even if you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. He says, listen, you have a lot of people who are trying to speak into your lives. And in this generation, you have TikTok trying to speak into your lives. Some of you go to TikTok to get wisdom. Try to get some guidance and direction. They don't know you. They don't care about you. Some of you go to Instagram, try to get you a little one minute motivational. They don't know you. They don't care about you. Some of you will go to Pinterest. Some of you go to Facebook. You go to all these things. He's saying, you got all these voices trying to vie for influence in your life, but they don't know you. They don't pray for you. They don't shepherd you. They don't care for you like I do in the church that you sit in. That's what Paul's saying. You got all these people, but none of them are praying over you and praying for you and battling spiritually for you like I am. That's what Paul's saying. All these voices, but you got very few fathers. And if you ask me what's missing in the church right now is you guys got a lot of voices. You got friends, family members, social media influencers, you got all these things trying to put input into your life, but are they coming with this? See, people think, people, people get it twisted like, oh, is, is, you know, are these people trying to be my father? And absolutely not. You only, you only got one father. That's how you got here. We're talking about spiritually. And this is why some of you, when the rains come, you go back to your old ways. When the hail comes, you go back to your old tendencies. When the storm comes and wipes out your house, you just abandon your faith in general. And you, you have long gaps of period in between your faith. I'm talking about you miss two or three years because you don't have a spiritual father speaking into your life. 
Look at what he says. This is what he says. He says this. He goes, therefore, he, he says, you do not have many fathers in Christ Jesus because I became a spiritual father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. Anytime you see the word therefore, this is a rule of thumb when it comes to reading the Bible. Anytime you see the, the word therefore, you have to ask, what is it there for? I'm not kidding. They'll literally tell you, go back and reread what you just read. Paul says, I'm not trying to shame you. I'm trying to warn you. I'm trying to give you a heads up. You got all these people, 10,000 voices, but you have not been spiritually fathered. So this is what he says. I'm sending Timothy to you, who is like a son to me. I I'm quoting it. You can trust me. You can just look at your own Bible quoting this. I'm sending Timothy to you, who's therefore like a son to me, that he might testify to the way that I live my life. Not just here, but at every church I go to, I am the same man. So what is Paul saying? I'm giving you reason to believe in what I'm telling you. And what is hurting you, Corinthians, what is harming you, what is literally capping your spiritual growth is you have not bought into the concept that we are a family. This is a family affair. And now you got all these voices, but you're not being fathered. So on my walk this morning, I wrote this down and I just want to read this to you. Um, in reading this passage of text, Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church and to let them know, although you've had, now in this case, they've had apostles, they've had elders, they've had bishops that come through and to speak into the church. You've had all these voices, but none of them have taken, none of them have, have taken an authority in your life to be a spiritual father of faith. So the truth of the matter is, and, and these are the two conclusions that I've come to. And the first one is this. He's saying to the Corinthian church that, um, what, you know, one conclusion quite possibly could be is that you have not been born again. There's no regeneration. There's no quickening of, of death to life from the spirit of God. You are absent of that because if you would have that, then you'd be led in truth because the Spirit of God will lead you to truth and therefore you'd understand the urgency in which I'm telling you, you need to have a spiritual covering. That's one conclusion. Or it's the second conclusion, which I feel most people fall into, so just hear me out. I feel most people uh, fall into this category, which is I've been born again, but I've been overexposed in one area and I haven't been quite developed in this area. I have an underdevelopment of understanding that I need a spiritual covering and that, I, and, and that I need a spiritual father in my life. And matter of fact, this is the moment where Paul is saying to the Corinthian church, you need to lean in. You got all these voices, but you have very few fathers. You need to lean in and you need to receive your spiritual father. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus that you might be corrected, you might be inspired, you might be encouraged, but also at times you might be called out and called up into a new level of growth. This is that lean in moment. Now, now I believe most people are there. And in this lean in moment of being fathered in the house, we are set with two options, two options. And there's only two if we're in a lean in moment, only two options. Okay. First option is that, um, we're not going to grow in this house, so we need to go find a different house. That's always an option. You do not belong to me. When we get to heaven, there will be no Adventure Church banner up there. Although the newest shirt we came out with, the Supernatural, that is a pretty fly shirt. I like to wear that one up there. I mean, it is biblical for faces. Come on. But we're not going to be up there. We're going to have a new white gown on us. We're going to be part of a choir. It's going to be great. Okay? It's going to be great. But I will probably have that Supernatural on underneath. That's what I'm saying. You know what I mean? A little undershirt. But you belong to the Lord. And if you don't want to be pastored in this house, my prayer is that you're pastored in some house. This is very, very important. You need to be pastored. You need somebody praying for you. You need somebody praying with you. You need somebody loving you. You need somebody encouraging you. My, my, my heart is that you'd be pastored. That's why when people, and, and listen, people have come up to me right before I preach and be like, pastor, we're leaving the church. I'm like, okay. Well, you're not mad? No, you don't belong to me. You belong to the Lord. I just would like to talk to you and make sure wherever you're going, you're going to be cared for and loved and taken care of. And they're going to love your kids. And they're going to help you with your marriage. I, I just care about you. Listen, I, I don't care about you to the point where I'm just trying to save you from going to hell. I care about you to where I'm trying to save you to the point that you don't got to walk through hell to get to hell. You'll catch that later. 
That's what I care about. Does that make sense? Hopefully, hopefully y'all catch that, okay, or caught that. So listen, the first conclusion is, is, is you're just, you don't belong to this fold. You, you need to go find your tribe. You need to go find the fold you, you belong to, which is fine. I want that for you. Or number two, the second conclusion is this. You're at a place where you're going to have to lean in and take ownership of your life. Because if this is church four or five and it's not clicking, don't think for one minute that church six, seven, and eight, something's going to happen. Because the end result is going to be the same because the problem is not the church. The problem is you. It's you. It's kind of like parents, we, we've, we've all had this, where, where you think it's the teacher until your kid has had a problem in every grade level with six different teachers. And then you finally come to the conclusion, mm, yeah, it might be you. It, it, it's, it's, it's you. And so going to another church isn't going to fix it. And this is why. I put the problem is deep within our own souls and it either comes from a wound or it comes from a sense of an independent spirit or rebellious. We have a rebelliousness inside of us in which we have to take responsibility and accountability and we must repent and allow the Holy Spirit to come lead us and guide us in our lives. And the reason is because a lot of us who have been hurt like this, we've said these words, I don't know if I can trust them. The only person I could ever really seem to trust is myself. Hear me now. That is the purest form of idolatry. You've put yourself on a throne and Jesus must worship your opinion, your feelings. That is a biblical definition, idol worship. And the biggest idol is you. When if we were all honest, the truth is, ready? You can't even trust yourself. I mean, if we could just go back and think of the last five years, how many mistakes we have made as people. You, you give me good reason why we should trust you and not Jesus. Right? How many of you already know last five years about three or four things you do different? That's just being honest. Right? And nobody knows that better than who? Parents. Nobody knows that better than parents. Shoot. Right? And so we see him using this imagery of the Thessalonians in the Corinthians church. You have very few fathers. And when we think about this, he uses a word in verse 17. He says, but brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned, in other words, separated from you in a short time. Why does he use the word orphan? If he's not referring to how people will walk around when they're not spiritually covered. When people aren't spiritually covered, they feel orphaned. And when people walk around orphaned, they have the same type of woundings, easily offended and offset, easily agitated and angered, easily this, easily that. No substance, no depths, the, the lack of the fruit of the spirit in their life, no love, no peace, no joy, and the, la and, and the abundance of the work of the flesh. The two things are, 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 are di diametrically opposed to one another, antithetical to each other. You can't walk in the fruit of the Spirit and fulfill the lust of the flesh. You can't say Jesus is Lord and, you still, and you're still struggling with all the same old sins before you came into the church. He's saying, but that's what happens when you start to feel orphaned. You start to feel like if you don't do it for you, nobody else will do it for you. And so when we have these lean-in moments, but I get it, but I get it. I get it because you compare your earthly father to your heavenly father and it just sets the whole thing off wrong. And we have to settle today. God is not like your dad. You don't understand. You're right, I don't understand. And actually nobody knows the full effect of that statement better than you. But what I can do 
is I can show you through the word of God if you'll lean in how God is not like that man. That's what I can show you. And it doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It's going to be rough. It's going to be hard. Some of the hardest tests I've gone through is as a Christian, but I will tell you this unequivocally, that my best day as a non-believer was not better than my worst day as a believer. Because there's something that I have that I can't let go of, and that's the hope that God is going to see me through. Paul goes on to wrap all this up. I want you to look at all the no statements, K-N-O-W. Hey guys, by the way, I, you already know this. Hey guys, you already know this. Hey guys, you already know this. Hey, y'all know that when I came here, I, I didn't come to try to get money from you. I didn't come to try to manipulate you. He said, I didn't come with a face covering on. I didn't put on a mask. You know, because when you walk around in the spiritual authority, you know who you are. You don't got a front for nobody. You, hey, listen, listen. And this, this, this has made more people leave the church than actually come to the church. I tell people all the time, if you don't like what you see on stage, you won't like what you see at the grocery store. Because I am what you see. I don't hide nothing. I have plenty of people in here who've been to my house a hundred times. They'll tell you, the dude is just who he is. Now that's offended some people. Like they expect me to like walk on water. I sink, baby. I'm telling you right now. I've tried walking on water. I sink. I got like no, you think as big as I am, I got some buoyancy. I ain't got none. Somebody have to come rescue me. I'll be drowning or something. You know what I mean? Like I don't, I don't, I don't float. And I don't, and listen, I, and I'll tell people if I'm having a bad day. I don't, I don't walk around with this mask on and thinking y'all got to think I'm something. I'm not, I'm not him. You know, I can't tell you how many times people have come up to me. I finally get to meet you, Pastor. I'm like, I'm really not that impressive. Like, trust me. I'm really not. I'm just ordinary. I'm so ordinary. I, I, I don't see her in here, but I, I, I took the boys. We got done working out at the ranch. I was covered dirt, mud, head to toe. I took them to In-N-Out Burger. And uh, I'm at In-N-Out I can't make this story up. I wish, I wish one of them was here. They'd tell you I'm not lying. I go to In-N-Out Burger, and I let these boys spend a lot of my money. And because, you know, what happened to the day of you just getting a cheeseburger? You know, the dude's walking up here, can I get two four-by-fours? Really? Because you ain't paying for it. That's why you're getting two four-by-fours. Then he has the audacity, can I get a chocolate shake too? Well, you might as well. You might as well. Why not? He goes, I'll get a small. Okay, whatever. <laughs> so the guy at the cash register says, hey, uh, are you their football coach? Oh, no, 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 nothing like that. I'm their pastor. And the young girl at the cash register goes, yeah, that's my pastor. And I'm like, oh, hi. <laughs> so then the guy from the back goes, and that's my pastor too. And I'm like, hey, let's just have church in and out burger. All right, let's see if we can't multiply this food. Come on, somebody. <laughs> that was honest though. <laughs> that was being real. We need to multiply the fries or something. <laughs> And um, I can't make this up. This is what I'm telling you. I'm just not, I'm just, I'm just a, a nobody who loves Jesus. I'm telling you. So I go to wash my hands. I cannot make this up. I go to wash my hands in the bathroom because I'm, I'm filthy. And so I'm kind of like wash off my wrist a little bit, you know. And this guy stops and he's waiting <clears throat> to wash his hands. So I'm like, I'll just be just a second. He sounds really dirty. He goes, hey, uh, what landscaping business you own? Orale. <laughs> so all those people who said, I don't think you're Mexican. Orale. <laughs> so I don't even know. This gets better. This gets better. This gets better. It gets better. It gets better. So, um, <laughs> that's so funny. So I don't even get a chance to answer. And he goes, hey, you don't see, I can really use your help. I just bought this big house. I got 10,000 square feet of yard that I need to landscape. So like, what can you do? How much do you charge? I'm like, I don't even tell you what I did yet. I'm like, he won't even let me answer. And so I just look at him. He goes, you got a card or something? And I'm like, I haven't even got a chance to answer. And I'm just smiling. Like, I don't know, I don't think he's, I don't know if he thinks I speak English or not. I don't even know. I'm just smiling like, yeah. And, and finally, Finally, I stop, I go, hey, uh, hey, um, 
I, I don't own a landscaping business. I'm a pastor. And he goes, oh, you don't got a card? <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't. That's That's Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this on, 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 on purpose for a reason. This is, this is always been since we started a real church. And what I mean by real is we just don't do fake. We're not, we're not scared if you come here with problems. We're not scared if you come here with hiccups. We're not scared if you come here with hangups. We're not, we're not scared of your past. We're not concerned to the point where we're gonna kick you out about your failures. We are the church of second and third chances. You, you are welcome here. And you're welcome to grow. You're welcome to allow Christ to transform your life. This is a place where you are welcome. And we're not, we're not intimidated at all because we know our God is greater. We know our God is stronger. And we know that God, if he could change my life, he could change yours. I have no doubt. We just, we literally, just want to love heaven in you. That's it. That's it. And yeah, we have standards. And yeah, we, we do the classes we do on purpose. Because we accept you just as you are. We're so glad you're here. But we love you so much, we're not going to allow you to stay that way because heaven is calling. And God wants to do something radical in your life. Amen? Stand to your feet. So let's do a little bit of business here. We're going to pray a very... Thank you, my man. We're going to pray a very... Uh, just kind of bold prayer. And we're just going to ask the Holy Spirit to just come and speak to us. And I just want to encourage some of you. Just go ahead and close your eyes. I just want to encourage some of you. I got to that point of talking about dads and I could just feel it in the room like, pastor, my dad, my dad. Hey, listen, forgiveness is not a destination. It's a journey, just like our freedom. And there are going to be things you forgave your dad about already. And there's going to be times where just this feelings and emotions come up over something and you're like, man, I feel like I need to forgive my dad again. And, and that's probably what you need to do. And I think until you kind of deal with some things on that level, you're going to find it really hard to be pastored because part of being pastored is being encouraged, but yet corrected, inspired, but yet rebuked. And that's what's missing. So I just really want to encourage you to, to just, if you're willing, I just want to pray a bold prayer with you right now. And just right where you're at, even if you're watching at home, just right where you're at. Not, you don't have to yell, just a, just a nice whisper. Say, Holy Spirit of God, what are you speaking to me? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over everybody here. As I trust Holy Spirit of God, you are speaking to them. That you are that you are speaking to them a word right now that is going to transform their lives, that is going to result in growth, immediate growth. I pray that we would find, we would find right now the courage to lean in and that we would find the strength to walk out our obedience and what you're asking us to do. I rebuke all the voices that are trying to contend right now and try to interrupt this word. And I pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus right now, that your sheep, would only respond to your Holy Spirit. And that's the only voice they would lean into. In Jesus' name, amen.